Hell, a concept woven into the fabric of our society. A place of fiery torment and eternal damnation, they say. You likely have an image of it in your mind. But is that image accurate? What do you truly know about hell? There is one simple verse that could end the discussion right now, but I will present it at the end of this video. Could everything you believe about hell be wrong? What if the Bible tells a different story, one far more complex than we've been led to understand? Does this mean eternal punishment is a myth? If these questions stir unease within you, if a sliver of doubt lingers, then you're in the right place. This is not a video about blind faith or religious dogma. This is an exploration guided by the very scriptures that shaped our idea of hell. I invite you to challenge your preconceptions, to open yourself to a deeper understanding. Because the truth about hell, it may be far more unsettling and profound than you ever imagined. When the word hell conjures images of horned demons and lakes of fire, we assume these have always been the core tenets of faith. Shockingly, this fiery vision has a complex and surprisingly non-biblical origin story. Centuries before Christ, ancient Greek and Roman mythologies were rife with underworld realms. Think of Hades, a shadowy place where all souls, good and bad, resided in a dreary existence. These early concepts didn't emphasize fiery torment, but rather an endless, joyless state. A far cry from the personalized, punitive hell we picture today. As Christianity spread, this underworld imagery gradually seeped into its doctrines. Early church fathers, influenced by prevailing philosophies, began to adopt the idea of a place of eternal suffering for the wicked. But where's the scriptural basis for this? If we open the Bible, expecting explicit descriptions of horned demons and fiery torture chambers, we won't find them. Terms like the Hebrew shield or Greek Hades pop up frequently, often translated simply as grave pit or the realm of the dead. In Psalm 1610, for instance, David confidently proclaims, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Was David referencing eternal torment, or the common grave where all people, even the holy, await resurrection? Jesus himself spoke of a place called Gehenna. This references a real valley outside Jerusalem, used as a garbage dump where fires smoldered. It became a powerful symbol of judgment. Notice, though, Jesus uses it as a metaphor, not a literal blueprint for a torture chamber. Perhaps the most jarring image comes from the book of Revelation, with its mention of a lake of fire. Here's the key. This lake of fire is described as the second death, Revelation 2014. Death implies cessation, an end, the very opposite of eternal conscious torment. For a deeper understanding of death and its implications for the concept of hell, Check the latest video in the description below. And yet this fiery vision of hell grew in popularity, becoming cemented in religious art and writings. But does this image truly harmonize with the nature of the God we find in the Bible? If God is defined as just and loving, and the scriptures overwhelmingly portray him this way, does everlasting torture align with his character? If we're honest, most of our mental images of hell come not from the Bible itself, but from centuries of art, literature, and pop culture. Think of Dante's Inferno with its nine circles of increasingly horrific torments, or countless paintings depicting writhing bodies engulfed in flames. These vivid portrayals have seeped into our collective understanding. But here's the surprising thing. If you scour the Bible for explicit, detailed descriptions of such a realm, you'll be searching for a long time. Instead of finding precise blueprints of torture chambers, you're far more likely to encounter words like perish, destruction, and consume. Consider this passage from the Apostle Peter. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. 2 Peter 2, 9-10 Notice he highlights not eternal pain, but the absence of light, a state of non-existence. Similarly, the prophet Malachi paints a stark picture. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up. Malachi 4.1 The imagery is one of complete annihilation, not unending suffering. This stark contrast raises questions. 
If a loving God seeks reconciliation rather than eternal vengeance, why has this fiery version of hell become the dominant belief? Did centuries of church history embellish and codify ideas that aren't fully grounded in the Bible? Before we hastily dismiss the traditional view, we must examine whether metaphors in the Bible truly align with a place of everlasting conscious torment. Jesus' references to Gehenna, the valley of burning refuse, may be symbolic of judgment, but is endless burning the essence of that judgment? It's important to remember the Bible often uses powerful symbolic language about the consequences of sin. Fire is a recurring motif, representing purification or complete destruction. Could it be that the focus is on permanent cessation of existence for the wicked, rather than eternal punishment? If we want to understand the Bible's true message about hell, we have to start with the language itself. The words most often translated as hell in our English Bibles carry far more nuanced meanings in their original Hebrew and Greek forms. Let's begin with the Hebrew word Sheol. Across the Old Testament, from Genesis to the Psalms, it pops up over 60 times. But rather than exclusively signifying a place of torment, Sheol more broadly means the grave, the shadowy resting place where all the dead, both righteous and wicked, await the resurrection. Think of Jacob overcome with despair at the supposed death of his son Joseph, for I shall go down into the grave Sheol to my son in mourning. Genesis 37:35. Was Jacob anticipating an eternity of fiery reunion with Joseph? Of course not. He saw Sheol as the common grave, a place of deep sorrow, but not a realm of torture. The New Testament equivalent is the Greek word Hades. Intriguingly, we find this applied even to Jesus himself. In Acts 2.27, quoting a psalm, Peter declares, You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Clearly, Hades, like Sheol, isn't synonymous with eternal damnation. Even the Christ awaited resurrection from it. Given his purity and innocence, it is clear that Jesus would not have gone to hell as a place of torment for the ungodly. Another frequently cited term is Gehenna. Jesus used this word, but it's vital to understand its origins. Gehenna was a literal valley outside Jerusalem, known as a dumping ground where refuse burned. It became a potent symbol of judgment and destruction. However, even when Jesus evokes this fiery image, it's often within parables or metaphors, emphasizing the consequences of sin, not painting a literal picture of a flaming subterranean world. The most dramatic image, perhaps, is the lake of fire in Revelation. This terrifying vision is unequivocally linked with the second death, Revelation 20, 14. Death, biblically speaking, signifies the cessation of life, an end, not a state of perpetual conscious suffering. The implications are staggering. If the very terms used to describe the fate of the wicked don't inherently carry the fiery baggage of popular culture, what are we left with? Could it be that centuries of interpretation layered additional meanings onto words originally focused on the grave, destruction, and an end, as opposed to endless torment? This raises an even more profound question. How does this state with its severe consequences square with the character of a God the Bible repeatedly describes as loving, just, and seeking restoration? If the ultimate aim is reconciliation, does the very concept of eternal, hopeless punishment fit within that framework? At the core of our understanding of hell lies an even deeper question, one that strikes at the heart of our understanding of God Himself. Throughout the Bible, we see a God defined by love, mercy, and a desire for restoration. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Psalm 145, 8. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Can we reconcile these portraits of a compassionate, sacrifice-driven God with the concept of eternal, relentless torture for His created beings? This question lies at the crux of this issue. The traditional view of hell often hinges on the idea of divine justice. If God is truly just, the argument goes, the wicked must receive their due punishment. But even within our human concept of justice, there's an inherent sense of proportionality. The punishment should fit the crime. John 5, 28 to 29 presents a stark contrast between the destinies of the righteous and the unrighteous. 
the righteous will be granted eternal life, while the unrighteous will face a finite condemnation for their actions in a finite life. This passage also indicates that a future judgment awaits all unjust, and that there is currently no burning hell where the lost are punished. The Bible isn't shy about portraying God's wrath and judgment against sin. However, even in these instances, we see a pattern of temporal punishment within a wider context of restoration. Take the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Their destruction was swift and absolute, yet even within the narrative, there's a focus on God's desire to spare those with even a shred of righteousness. Perhaps the most potent question is this, what is the ultimate aim of punishment? If we view it solely through a lens of cruel retribution, devoid of any redemptive purpose, we paint a chilling portrait of a capricious, vindictive God. However, if the focus is on the utter destruction of sin, rather than the perpetual torment of the sinner, a different picture emerges. Could it be that the very nature of God, defined as merciful and relentlessly pursuing restoration, contradicts an eternity devoted to hopelessness and unyielding cruelty? Is the Bible, instead, pointing us toward an ultimate victory over sin and death, one where evil meets absolute annihilation? A cornerstone of the traditional hell concept is the belief in an immortal soul that persists even after the body dies, capable of experiencing eternal bliss or everlasting pain. But this idea finds surprisingly little support within the Bible itself. Let's turn to the very beginning, Genesis 2-7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Notice that man became a soul. He wasn't given an independent soul as a separate entity. The Bible presents a unified view of humanity. Body and spirit are inseparable components that together form a living being. If we remove one component, the living soul disappears. This mortal nature of the soul is further solidified in Ezekiel 18.4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Here the equation is clear. Souls are not inherently immortal, they face death as a consequence of sin. This directly contradicts the notion of an indestructible spiritual essence that lives on independently of the body, but is in accordance with 1 Timothy 6.16 that says, Lord of Lords, who only hath immortality, clearly shows God to be the only immortal being. If there's no immortal soul capable of eternal suffering, it reshapes our image of hell. The idea of a disembodied spirit experiencing unending torment loses its basis. Instead, the focus shifts to the ultimate fate of the entire person, body and soul. This raises an interesting point. What happens to the dead in this interim period between physical death and the final resolution? The Bible offers intriguing clues through phrases like, asleep. Consider Jesus' words about his deceased friend Lazarus. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. John 11.11 11. Notice the emphasis. Lazarus is asleep awaiting resurrection, not living in a spiritual state. Similarly, the Apostle Paul describes those who have died in Christ as those who sleep in Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 4.14. These metaphors portray death as a temporary state of non-consciousness, not an active existence in a spiritual realm. If the wicked do not persist as active souls after death, then their punishment can't be in the form of eternal conscious torment. Are we left with an empty void, or does the Bible's language of destruction point to a different outcome? If the core of our being is mortal and indivisible, what state awaits us after death? Do we experience an instant transition to eternal bliss or torment, or does the Bible offer a different and perhaps surprising picture? The recurring biblical motif of sleep offers a captivating perspective. In John 11, 11, 14, Jesus, with startling directness, refers to his friend Lazarus's death as sleep. However, he clarifies his meaning, speaking of waking him up, alluding to the resurrection. Paul amplifies this theme in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, explicitly referring to those who have died in Christ as those who sleep. Their existence is suspended in an unconscious state, awaiting the moment when Christ returns to awaken them. Notice again the underlying theme of a temporary state, not an ongoing active experience of heaven or hell. Crucially, this concept of sleep isn't reserved solely for the righteous. 
Thinkers across the ages have struggled with this. If the wicked are immediately dispatched to eternal fiery torment upon death, why does the Bible extend the metaphor of rest to them as well? The Bible's use of fiery imagery, particularly surrounding the lake of fire, holds a deeper meaning. While a literal lake of unceasing flame seems out of step with a god of love, the imagery of complete destruction offers a different interpretation. Consider Malachi 4.1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. The focus of this passage is not on endless suffering, but on a complete and irreversible end. Psalm 37.10 and 20 provide a clear picture of the fate of the wicked. After the judgment, they will not face an eternity of torture. Instead, they will simply disappear, their place no longer to be found. They will vanish like smoke. Isaiah 47, 14. Behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. The verse is clear. There will be no trace left of the wicked after the punishment. The Bible never portrays the reward of the wicked as being eternal. Rather, it consistently teaches that they will receive a just end in accordance with their deeds. As the book of Job confirms, the wicked are eventually carried to the grave. Job 21 30, 32. Death is the great equalizer, indicating that God does not prolong punishment beyond the limits of a mortal life. The lake of fire in Revelation could hold symbolic power. It represents the second death, defined as the utter eradication of the wicked. If the first death is a temporary unconsciousness, the second death, like a consuming fire, signifies a permanent termination of existence, not the continuation of life in a realm of endless torment. According to Ezekiel 28.18, Satan's fate will be similar to that of men who chose rebellion over obedience to God, complete destruction. Satan's reward will be proportional to his actions, Verse 18 says, Therefore I will bring forth fire from the midst of you, it shall devour you, and I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. Like the men who rebelled against God, there will be absolutely nothing left of Satan. This fundamentally reshapes our image of hell. No longer do we have to struggle with visualizing demonic torture chambers. Instead, hell becomes synonymous with finality, with the ultimate consequence of sin, being absolute non-existence. When the Bible uses words like forever and eternally, it's tempting to map our modern understanding of unending time onto these passages. However, a close examination reveals that the concept of eternity within the biblical context is far more nuanced and complex. Consider Jonah 2.6, where from the depths of despair, Jonah cries out, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet we know Jonah was miraculously delivered after three days. Clearly his forever was a finite period defined by the limits of his desperate situation. Similarly, in Deuteronomy 23.3, a Moabite is described as barred forever from entering the assembly of the Lord. While this seems like an eternal exclusion, the context reveals that the restriction applies for ten generations. Significant, but not endless. Further insight comes from verses like 1 Samuel 1.22.28 which describe Hannah dedicating Samuel for temple service forever. In practice, this meant as long as Samuel lived. Thus, forever is tied to the context of an individual lifespan. Even in Exodus 21.6, where a servant willingly chooses to serve his master forever, the historical context reveals that this likely referred to the lifespan of either the servant or the master, or perhaps even until the year of Jubilee. A significant period, but not infinite. In 2 Samuel 7:16, God makes a promise to David, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. At first glance, this promise seems to guarantee a literal, unending reign for David. However, understanding the true intention of the prophecy requires analyzing the historical and cultural context. The promise of an eternal kingdom for David doesn't refer to a literal reign without end. Instead, it symbolizes the Davidic dynasty that would rule Israel for a long period, culminating in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In Genesis 19.24, God rains down fire and sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, destroying the cities and their inhabitants. The Bible states that the smoke of Sodom's burning goes up forever. 
Genesis 19, 28. Sodom's destruction was a real event with eternal consequences. The city was utterly destroyed, and its inhabitants were condemned. The smoke rising forever serves as a constant symbol of God's wrath against sin and the devastation it can cause. But does this mean the smoke is still literally rising today? Or does it signify that the effects of the destruction were eternal, meaning Sodom and Gomorrah no longer exist? These examples challenge our assumption that eternal in the Bible always signifies a never-ending state. Instead, it often signifies a period of significant length, defined by context, whether that context is an individual's life, a theological purpose, or specific historical circumstances. This distinction has profound implications for our understanding of concepts like heaven and hell. Could it be that the eternal reward promised to the faithful isn't solely measured in ceaseless time, but rather defined by the quality of existence in God's presence? Similarly, does the eternal punishment facing the wicked truly imply never-ending torture? Or could it encompass a different kind of finality, the utter termination of existence? And doesn't the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 to 31 teach an eternal hell of torment? No. It is a parable Jesus used to emphasize a certain spiritual lesson. The point of the story is found in verse 31 that says, and he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Parables should not be taken literally, otherwise we would believe that trees talk. See Judges 9, 8 to 15. Here are some facts making it clear that Luke 16, 19 to 31 is a parable and cannot be used as a basis for doctrines. A Abraham's bosom is not heaven, and Abraham himself is waiting for the time when he will enter heaven. Hebrews 11, 8 to 10 and 16. B. People in hell can't talk to those in heaven. Isaiah 65, 17. C. The dead are in their graves. Job 17, 13, John 5, 28 and 29. The rich man was in bodily form with eyes, a tongue, etc. Yet we know that the body does not go to hell at death, but remains in the grave, as the Bible says. D. People are rewarded at Christ's second coming, not at death. Revelation 22:12. E. The lost are cast into hell at the end of the world, not when they die. Matthew 13, 40 to 42. We should not use this parable as the only source of information for our religious beliefs. The purpose of this parable is to inspire people to follow God's will. From the fiery pronouncements of prophets to Christ's own warnings, the Bible doesn't shy away from the reality of judgment. Peter reminds us that God reserves the unjust for a day of darkness, 2 Peter 2, 9. And Jesus vividly describes a separation of the righteous from the wicked, the latter cast into a fiery furnace, Matthew 13, 40-42. Yet this isn't a gleeful declaration of endless suffering. The Apostle John clarifies that there will be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous, John 5, 28 and 29. Judgment isn't immediate, but rather a future event followed by the restoration of the just. Sin carries its own wages, and as James states, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. James 1.15 Sin's consequence is a built-in self-destruction, not eternal torture inflicted by a vengeful God. The wicked, Revelation 21.8, warns, will face the second death, a finality that echoes utter destruction. If death is the temporary common denominator, is this the final act? Thankfully, no. God, who alone possesses immortality, 1 Timothy 6, 16, promises something profound. He will banish death once and for all. The Genesis narrative reveals that God barred humanity from the tree of life after the fall, Genesis 3, 22-24, to prevent them from living eternally in a sinful state. This speaks of mercy, not cruelty. So this state of immortality is conditioned by the consumption of the fruit of the tree of life and obedience to God. Revelation 22, 2. Through Christ, however, the promise of eternal life re-emerges. Malachi's prophecy envisions a day when the wicked are reduced to ashes, Malachi 4, 1 to 3, while the righteous, with access to that tree of life, enter a state where death has no dominion. Even the fiery demise of Satan in Ezekiel 28, 18 symbolizes complete annihilation. Evil itself has an expiration date, not an eternal torture chamber where it festers and multiplies. Remember that verse I mentioned at the beginning? 
As Paul declares in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. This death, the Bible makes clear, is not a state of perpetual conscious torment, but the cessation of existence. However, the verse continues, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, an existence freed from sin and death becomes not just possible, but guaranteed. This is the heart of God's message and the hope at the core of the biblical narrative. Hell is not a place, it is an event. But it is not as we have been taught to fear it. Its ultimate purpose is to eradicate sin, leaving only eternal life and restoration in the presence of God. Real quick, now you can engage even more and support this channel by becoming a member. Becoming a member unlocks amazing resources and helps you connect even deeper. Get access to every image I use, perfect for your wallpaper, studies or presentations. Need a custom visual for a study group or a Bible verse that speaks to you? I'll design it. And members get to suggest entire video topics they'd love to see explored. Honestly, this is about more than perks. It's your chance to directly shape the content and help me create videos that matter most to you. Check the description for details. Thanks so much for being part of this community. God bless.